All right, so now look at, look at what I'm skipping possibly for the entire class, but hopefully just for now. Uh, 3.2 multivariate LA series is a bit frightening for people. 3.3, 3.4. 3.3 is uh, optimization. 3.4 is Lagrange multipliers, which is another kind of optimization. Okay? So we are now moving into 5.1. So integration is possibly the most important thing that I can teach you. Integration. Because, I mean, when I use calculus 3, I mostly use it for integration. When I do differentiation, it's only as, um, as a sub-procedure for integrating something. Okay? So even, even in one of the books that I was reading, the only way I was able to get through a bunch of pages is because it actually was Calc 3. It was all for quasi-conformal mappings, but really, if you look at the machinery, it's mostly Calc 3 machinery that, uh, that made some, some things work. All right, so many concepts uh, in probability and physics and everywhere else is just related to, uh, to the problem of area, right? So for example, one obvious problem is New York, right? The problem in New York is the problem of not having enough space, right? That's why apartments are extremely expensive. Some people live in Manhattan and pay 2,500 for, for a closet, <laughs> right? And, and, uh, and others, even, even more moronic, they actually want to move here. All right, well, that's one example of everyday life. Now, let's, what, what's an example of, uh, of uh, this problem in probability? Probability is heavily involving integrating. Now, roughly why? Here is an, a nice example. This is why, by the way, it was a competition example a long while ago. Uh, this is not my solution. I solved it using another limiting procedure, but the solution is more elegant. It was my friends. Maybe somebody knows Jordi. Anybody knows Jordi? Well, it's too bad. He is now in China. He used to be one of the tutors down in uh, Dulce. Yeah, he was a, tu a tutor at some time long ago. He was a teacher, and now he is in China. All right, anyhow, so we have this example. Two forgetful professors want to meet in order to write an exam together. Since they cannot remember the exact time of meeting, they agree to do the following. So each will come anywhere between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m., wait for the other 15 minutes, and leave if the other one does not show up. Okay? So, I mean, the statement is whatever, right? Forgetful. Not, I would not forget to give you an exam. Don't worry about that. But, uh, but basically, uh, what we can do is, when we look at it mathematically, it's like in this movie Sliders, right? Or what is movie or is it a series, right? Sliders. Anybody knows what sliders are? So they, they all jump through alternative universes. So I can think of... Uh, of all the possible universes that can exist, right? So there are universes uh, where the professors meet and there are universes where the professors do not meet. Okay? Didn't we look at the problem earlier in the semester? Huh? Didn't we do the problem earlier in the semester? No. no. Oh, I, my probability class. Ah. I, I have, I, so there is a similar problem. No, uh, I took the prop stats on my other school. Ah, it's really did this problem. Even the same problem? The statistics class. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, this, is, this is possibly, yeah, possibly, uh, yeah. It's a statistics. It, it's a, it's a, yeah, I mean, I hate the word statistics. I mean, I once screamed at a girl that said that she took a class like this. Because, you know why? I mean, really, I mean, it's, 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 it's a war trauma. Because, you know, I mean, uh, there, is, there is this uh, smart, dumb type of uh, subject. Like, you have people that don't know basic math. And uh, what they're dealing with is just some sort of just chewed up advanced mathematics, right? They just have some advanced mathematics that they just kind of wipe themselves with and they, they throw it. The equation. Yeah, they give you an equation, like, okay, just to calculate standard deviation, do sample statistics. There are things there that I don't know. I'm also angry because somebody also emailed me about it last night and bothering me with stupid, you know, things on, on for tutoring, right? <laughs> right, so anyhow. I, I, I hate statistics, right? So it's called probability theory. Right. right? Probability theory, right? But then it's nicer, right? Okay, don't call it that. So, <laughs> all right, sorry. So what, what we have is uh, we, can, we can picture the, so this, we can picture uh, all events. I can just, I can say this is one hour, right? So zero means one o'clock, one means uh, two o'clock, right? So we have zero, one, and zero, one. So this, uh, the set of all points x, y represents all possible events of when one professor X arrives and when Professor Y arrives. Okay? So for example, one half, one half is the universe where both professors arrived at 1.30. Exactly. Okay? 
So then uh, the question is, uh, how do we uh, calculate the likelihood of the meeting? If, it, if they're equally likely to show, each of them is equally likely to show at any given moment of time, then I just want to, roughly speaking, count the number of universes where they uh, don't show up too far apart. So I draw this line. So this line represents all possible universes where the professors did what? Exactly at the same time. So if I draw a line uh, which is one quarter higher and another one quarter lower, this is the corridor of where one professor, anything inside here, any line inside of it, is where the professors did not show uh, too far apart. Right? One quarter is because it's, uh, because it's 15 minutes. Right? So basically, all we need to really do is just calculate the area of that region. Yes? If I know the area, and I'm not going to do it since it's already, you know, I just sketch it, it's pretty easy. You just calculate this triangle and that triangle and just remove them and you have the area of that region and that's the likelihood that they will meet. Assuming that they're equally likely to arrive at any given moment of time. Okay? So that's how area can be, the question of area can be just applied to, to this problem of probability. And that's what you do all the time. In physics, I mentioned a little bit, right, that the statement about conservation of energy is really a statement about the fundamental theorem of calculus from the perspective of mathematics. So uh, you really are saying that the energy at uh, time A and the difference of that from the energy at time B is really going to be constant. It's not really that and there, is a, there is a given number of what energy is. What matters is that it's conserved, is that the difference is always constant. And that's really a statement about the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that's again relates to integration. Okay. So what are we what, what are we going to do here? So intuition behind area and volume. So be, before that, first of all, what is area? Give me some sort of explanation of what is area. Yeah, yeah space. I hear space. So area is what? is a measurement of the vastness of space. That's how I would word it, OK? Area is a measurement of the vastness of space. So uh, in particular, it's two-dimensional space that we, we, when we say area, right? So let's actually, I, I sometimes do that interchangeably. Let's, let's just get, get a one, uh, one name for it. Let's call it volume, right? And let's give it dimension. So one-dimensional volume is the measure of the vastness of a one-dimensional space. So that's a fancy way of saying length, right? Two-dimensional volume is area, and three-dimensional volume is volume, and four-dimensional volume is, again, right? So we will just give it the word volume, or sometimes area if you prefer. That's, that's useful because you connect those ideas. You think that length and area and volume are all, pretty much all the same. They have the same properties, in essence. Okay? So then how are we going to do that? So the easiest way is like what we do with this floor. Like, how, what, what do I mean by vastness of space? So if I'm measuring area, I'm just going to select a unit tile. And that, what, what I mean is just a, some sort of segment that I'm going to call 1. And usually it's a square because that's kind of convenient, right? Square is a, is a very convenient uh, shape with which to tessellate space, with which to just uh, stack it together and, uh, and just exhaust all of space, all of two-dimensional space. So, but the thing is, there are some shapes that are very non-quadratic, right? They cannot really be stacked up. Mm -hmm. So most shapes that you, that you know, you can be approximated. So let's say I have this blob, and I want to measure how vast is the space contained in that blob. So what I do is I imagine taking a photograph of it, and I'm not sure if that's a word, pixelize or digitize, right? So in other words, I'm just like in the phone, you, you, you see at the picture, if you looked at a microscope of that picture, it's built up of many small pixels, of many squares or if it's volume cubes, like Lego blocks. And if they are very, very tiny, they look to you indistinguishable. So for our class, that's going to be enough. But actually, you can show mathematically there exist uh, segments that uh, are inherently not rectifiable. The word is rectifiable means they cannot be, uh, you cannot approximate the amount of space contained in them by, uh, by measuring it using rectangles. You understand? So they are very rare. To, it's very hard to come by such things. You really have to really think very hard. At some day, some time long ago, actually not that long ago, maybe even 100 years ago, right? And it's still in the 20th century. If you come up with that example, you would get a PhD for it. And maybe even be named, it would be named after you, right? Because those things were not so obvious. And they're hard to come by. But in general, you would imagine that uh, if I select very fine 
tiny uh, microscopic squares. I can just, uh, instead of actually uh, answering the question for the actual blob, I can create a dummy blob made of uh, small rectangles. That's called rectifiable set. And, and, and the difference between the space contained in here and here is really negligible, in a sense. So having stated that, uh, one of the main um, tools we're going to use is uh, Cavalieri's principle. So Cavalieri wanted to investigate how to calculate, uh, let's say, the volume of, of shapes. So here is um, a picture of a chicken leg. Right? So my goal is to find the volume of the chicken leg under certain assumptions. So first of all, this chicken leg, if you measure it against this x-axis, it's measuring exactly from A to B. So in other words, if you project, if you take this, uh, uh, this three-dimensional object and you cast its perpendicular shadow onto the x-axis, it's just an interval. It's a solid interval. You understand that? So that's an important part of Cavalieri's principle. So I can measure the length of it from A to B. Now imagine that uh, there exists a function that for any given x will tell you the cross-sectional area of the face of the chicken. So it'll tell you the number. So in essence, I mean, imagine that what you do is uh, you go to this butcher, and he's going to then take a, take a saw, and he's going to go right and cut. You just specify which x between a and b, and he's going to slice that chicken like there. And then, he, and then the shape that you're going to see is this thing. Right? You're going to see the shape to be to be something like this. So this is the cross-sectional cut. And I can label it as A of x. Mm. For different x's, there is going to be a different shaped cut, which has possibly different area. We're going to see examples of where that will become more concrete and obvious. But you, can you believe that? Can you see that if you slice something, then, put mm -hmm. then at, at any given x, it would have a, an, an area A of x? Yeah. Uh, that drawing, it's like you're pointing the chicken like at us, right? Yes. I just kind of cut it here. And I point it at you, right? So this is uh, uh, this is basically front of you. And if I look, I basically I'm also going to make another cut at another point very close by, behind, right? So if I now twist this uh, chicken leg to the side, what I'm going to see is I'm going to see a side view that looks something like this, possibly. Think about um, cutting bread or think about cutting pastrami into very thin layers. Now you can see that this segment is not cylinder. It's not a cylinder. You agree? Because you see that if it's a cylinder, it would be a, a shape projected along a line. But in this case, look at it. The shape is not projected along a line. There is some narrowing, some sort of things are happening. It's not a cylinder. But if the uh, surface is very, it's continuous, uh, then you can approximate it by a cylinder. right? So this is not a cylinder, but it is approximately if the slice is very thin, it's approximately this from the side view, where this is delta xk. This is the width, right? Where delta x is very small. Can you yep. Repeat what you mean by it's not projected along a line? What is a cylinder? A cylinder is uh, you take you take a shape and you <coughs> drag it out along an axis. Now, this is not a shape that is produced this way, at least not along, the, you know, not along any perpendicular axis. Mm. So the back side is different from the front side. Mm. So to calculate the volume of this thing, right, I know, I know the cross-sectional area. If it were a cylinder, the cross-sectional area, this, this here, has cross-sectional area A of xk. So what's the volume here? The volume here would be, what's the volume of the shape? A xk times delta xk. Absolutely. So the volume of that segment is uh, a x k times delta x k. You see it here in this picture, right? So in essence, this shape, you look at it, here is the, the view from the side. Delta x i, I call it i here, doesn't matter, right? This is the thickness of that uh, slice, of the pastrami slice. And this is the cross-sectional area. So I want to say the volume of that segment, of that red segment, is just the area at the front, a of x, times the thickness. Yeah? Uh, well, if it, basically, 
I, I am having a function that is able to tell me the area of each, uh, of, each, of, of each face of my pastrami. So if I look at the face of the pastrami, I know its area. And if the pastrami slices are really, really thin, they are nearly cylindrical. I can pretend that they are cylindrical. At least that's, that seems to be the intuition, right? So in other words, I, try, I pretend that I'm going to construct this chicken leg out of, uh, out of cylindrical approximations, right? I'm just going to take cylindrical dumbbells and I'm going to just uh, build this chicken leg. It's not going to be exactly a chicken leg, but if the pastrami slices are really, really thin, it's going to be really a good imitation. And therefore, its volume is going to be a good imitation. You agree? So. I hope you know, at least I had a few students that took my classes. You all are very good with Riemann sums, right? You should be really good with Riemann sums because, uh, um, because basically what's the volume of the chicken like then? The sum of all the small segments, right? So I would say that uh, volume of chicken leg is approximately equal to the sum where k goes from 1 to n of a x k times delta x k. That's the volume of, this, of the slices, right? So what I'm really saying is the volume of the entire chicken leg is the sum of the slices, where in fact the sum of the slices was replaced by the sum of cylindrical slices, which is not necessarily true, as you can see in this picture, right? It's the area in front is different from the area in the back. You can see it's narrower there. But if the slices are very, very thin, it's almost the same. That's why I wrote almost. And wh what, I, what did I do? I summed over all the possible slices. Right? I summed over, let's say, where n is a very large number, I, slide, I summed over a very big number of slices. So in the limit, that should be, uh, that should be the exact volume. So what is this uh, going to approach in the limit? In the limit, this is going to be what? Do you recognize this? What is this? What is this? Uh, when you see this thing, something just right away starts working in your mind, and you right away see what it is. If I push the limit, what is that? Volume. Integral. Integral. It is the integral from where to where? From A to B. From A to B. This is the integral. Again, if, if you need a crash course in it, again, <laughs> right? It's the integral from A to B of AX dx. Now you see this, this notation is really suggestive. What is uh, this integral? Why, do you know, why is it looking like that? Do you know? Sum. It's the sum, right? This is really saying it's the sum of all the infinitesimal rectangles whose altitude is ax and whose width is dx, right? So that's, that's, the, le that's the height of the rectangle times the width of the rectangle. OK, so where a of x is what? Where a of x is actually the cross-sectional area. Make sense? So again, I mean, for me, it's a bit torturous. I think, well, I mean, infinitesimal? Like, what are you talking about? Uh, let's write Riemann sums here, and let's prove it. And then actually, we need to, to truly prove it. We, we need to the concept of supremum and infimum, because we need uh, lower, lower sums and upper sums. That thing is covered in, in Spivak. Yeah. But, Regardless, I mean, you just when you see this thing, you right away know that in the limit that should be this integral looking around. Right? So this means the sum of all the possible uh, the volumes of the slices, which are just the cross-sectional area times the width of the slice. Okay, so that's Cavalieri's principle. And obviously, it doesn't work in general because what's the assumption? The assumption is that the slices can be re replaced by cylindrical slices. So the assumption is true, provided uh, the area function is continuous, for example. Right? And provided, that the, in fact, that the, that the shapes are, are continuously changing. Right? So in other words, the shapes of slices are continuously deformed. So in essence, if the slice is very thin, this front cell shape should be very nearly the back shape. Okay? So there should be a continuity of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the outline curves of the surface. Possibly this can be relaxed. OK, so this was all very theoretical. Let's actually see in practice. Uh, when we can actually know the cross-sectional area and examine this Cavalieri's principle in better detail. So we look at uh, exhibit A. Exhibit A is a box. And we want to find the volume of that box. Obviously, it's easy, but we want to find the volume of the box using this new idea, because that's what we are going to generalize. So then 
why can we use Cavalieri's principle here? It's because however I decide to partition it, the cross-sectional areas are known to me. What is, what is the shape of any cross-section? A square, right? So in, in, I, will, I will position, so what I'll do is I'll take this rectangle and I, or this, this box and I will place it so that on the z-axis so that it goes from 0 to c. And I'm going to slice it so this would be uh, z equal to 0 and this would be z equal to c and I'm going to then slice it like this. So this here is a of z. Great. This would be A of Z. I need to predict what is, what is A of Z. Now tell me, please, what is the cross-sectional area A of Z? A times B. In this case, it's obvious, right? So in this case, that's an example. As I like, actually, the German way of saying that. Das ist uns vorhanden, yeah? It's, it's actually in front of our hand. It's given to us. Yes? Das Gebietfunktion ist uns vorhanden. Correct? Yes. So, you see, uh, the area function is, is, is in front of us. It's very easy here. So then, uh, what do I need to do to find the volume of the box by Cavalieri's principle? Sum them. Well, sum them, and that's a, f a fancy way of doing that is integrate. integrate from where to where? Zero to C of what? Of AZ. And what do I write here? DZ. Because you see, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, the pastrami slices are, well, here they are, right? That's their, that's their thickness. Yes? That's, the, that's our DZ, great? So that's my pastrami slices. So DZ is, is the thickness of my pastrami slice, which is, it's infinitesimal, roughly speaking, right? Just again, I hate, I hate those words. When you say I hate this word, yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, say it again, yes. Is, is, does it mean small? Yes. Okay. I had to adapt because for complex analysis, there are some ideas. If you don't do that, then it's, it's impossible to just digest it, right? It's impossible to have a, a geometric sense. But I hate the word infinitesimal, since what is infinitesimal is just very, very small, really, right? But, but they say kind of smaller than small. Oh. That makes no sense, right? right? Huh? Well, I mean, really, it's, it's just disease, it's just, like, it's just a microscopic segment, right? right. But you can actually, uh, you can make it rigorous. So what is this then? This is the integral from 0 to c of a, b, d, z, which is obviously a, b, c, which, is, which agrees with our intuition. Okay? That's a very trivial example of how Cavalieri's principle can be applied here. Now, exhibit, here is another exhibit. What's the volume here? Same thing. Same thing. Now, now, roughly why? What I imagine is I imagine that somebody sliced a sausage that, was, uh, that looked like a box, right? And then somebody pushed it. Somebody artistic came in and just kind of pushed it around, right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? So basically, it's like, it's like a building or not. So, so the slices that you had here, they were moved. Because look at it. If I cut it at any z, the slice at the same location, uh, supposedly, is of the same exact shape. Good? So those two things have the same exact uh, volume. Now let's look at a slightly less trivial example. And that would be that of a pyramid. We want to find the volume of a pyramid using Cavalieri's principle. It cannot be the same thing. I mean, uh, OK, so, so let's, let's look at it. How is it, in this case, how would you like to sl slice it? Yeah, I mean, like, like this? Yeah. No. <laughs> Nah, that, 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 I mean, but easier, easier, I think, to do it like this, right? So slice it by horizontal, like by horizontal motions of the knife, so parallel to the x, y. That's what you meant, right? Yeah. Okay. Because vertically, I understood slice it like that. Oh, no. That's also possible, right? But it's harder. So okay, so we have this. So we need to find uh, the the formula for the cross-sectional area. Right? So first of all, I can measure it against the z-axis, and on the z-axis, it's just an interval from zero to c, for example, right? Now, what is the shape of the cross sections here? They are square. not square necessarily because it's AB, so they are rectangles. Right, good. So, that, that, so we know the shape, so it's, it's again, it should not be too hard to figure it out. So here is how I would do it, okay? So I would take this shape 
and I would impale it with the, with this tip on the zero of the axis. So that's, in essence, I'm going to draw the z. Forgive me, I'm going to do it horizontally. It's a little easier for me to think this way. So this is my z axis. And let me just uh, uh, push the x axis is coming at, at you this way. And I'm going to impale this pyramid on the z-axis here. So now tell me, OK, this is 0 here, and this here is c. What can you tell me about uh, this length here, this here? What's this? Yeah, either half of a or half of b. Let's say x is, is a, right? So that would be. So that would be one half a. OK, very good. So then what I'm going to do is I need to figure out the cross-sectional area at uh, any given uh, point. So let's say if I move from here, it's going to be, it's going to be really, this is my x of z, or, uh, or something like that. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'm actually going to label it as 2x of z, and this as 2y of z. And the area is the product of those. Now, why am I going to label it as 2? Is because, OK, here, suppose I pick a z. So then this is my x. If this is z, this is x. So what do I know? I see, I see two triangles that are, uh, that are symmetric. So I know that x divided by z is the same as 1 half of a divided by c. Do you agree? So I know that x is equal to 1 half a over c times z. Now, I don't need x because x is just one segment. Right? I mean, I, I, need, I need to double that segment to get the other part. All right, so we have this triangle. They, they see that the small triangle and this, this right triangle. Don't forget about the bottom. The bottom is, can be ignored, right? So this, the top triangle, it's, it's, it's two right triangles that are, sim that are similar. The big triangle is similar to the small triangle. Do you see that? So if they are similar, that means that the ratio of x to z is the same as 1 half of a to c. So once I have that, I just now multiply, and I have uh, a solution for what x is in terms of z. Now, I don't really need x, because my side length of the square, or sorry, of the rectangle, is not x, but 2x. That's why I label that as 2x, right? So I multiply this by 2, so I'm going to have 2x of z is simply a over c times z. Now, similarly, I can calculate what is 2y of z, and what's that? Y of z, I just relabel the thing, so now this is, would be 1 half b. So that would be b over c. You agree? So exactly the same, it's just basically I just now uh, moved and, and, and would change this x to y axis, and I just have a similar picture. So we have 2y of z is this. So now I have that the area at z is simply a over c z times b over c z, which is just simply a b over c squared z squared. You agree? That's my cross-sectional area. You, you all understand, yes? So what is then the volume? By Cavalieri's principle, what's the volume? Volume is, uh, so what, what do I, how do I write it as an integral first? Integral from where to where? Zero c. Zero c of a z d z, which is the integral from 0 to c of a b over c squared z squared d z, which is just if you integrate, you get 1 third a b c. Agreed? So you, you just, just call, verify it's one third ABC. All right. Before we don't, no, we're not yet going. So one thing to, to notice, by the way, I wrote ABC over 12, and that's because I forgot to multiply x by 2 and y by 2. So basically, there, it should be multiplied by 4. So there is a typo in my notes. But you see what it is here, right? All right, one last question before, uh, and then we are done with this chapter, and then you can go. All right, so this I like. You see, so that's, a, that's another, 
That's actually from your book, Marsden and Tromba. So what you have is a lumberjack is uh, cutting a tree by removing a wedge from it, right? So the way you produce this wedge is that you're going to take your axe and swing it horizontally, and that produces one cut here. And then uh, the lumberjack swings the axe at an angle theta with respect to the xy plane. So that's the theta here, and he, he cuts this uh, wedge out. And that's how you drop a tree. Now, the tree trunk is, um, is a cylinder of radius r, some radius r. So, so, and, and the angle is theta, so the question is to find the volume of the wedge. Find the volume of the wedge. So the picture is pretty nice. I think uh, you, you should be able to, uh, to see what's happening. So first of all, you see we have half of the circle. So if I, if I draw the x-axis, yeah. ah, you see, here I go. For me, that's normal. I'm lefty, right? But I guess for you, no. Right? Okay, so the x-axis goes like this, right? So that's x. And uh, here we have the upper part of the circle. Somewhere here is y. So what are, if, if I'm going to cut it, uh, if I'm going to cut this uh, wedge by planes that are coming from the xy plane, and, and the plane is basically parallel to the y-axis, so the shape I'm going to get is always a triangle. Do you see that? It's always going to be a triangle. So the cross-sectional areas are really areas of triangles, of right triangles, in fact. So then the, this uh, circle is of uh, radius r, so this is uh, x equal to minus r all the way to x equal to r. And what's the, what's the length of y? I need to figure out the length of y, and to figure out the, that would be the base of the triangle, and the height of the triangle is h. So what is y? What's the, if, I, if, I cut it, if I cut this uh, wedge at the point x, what's going to be the length of the uh, base? So this is x squared plus y squared equal to r squared. So that means that y is just equal to root of r squared minus x squared. Yep. You see, that's my y. Now, what can I do for my h? So if I have this y, this is my, I put it on the side. This is y. This is h. All I know is that this angle is, is a fixed number theta. So how do I, do I figure what, what h is now? Almost. Better, better not to use this hypotenuse, right? Best to use tangent. So what we have is tangent of theta is equal to h over y. So that means that h is equal to y times tangent of theta. So I have an extra y. So in essence, my, my, my area of x is equal to 1 half y of x times y of x tangent theta. Which is, which is the square of y of x, so that's going to equal to 1 half root of, uh, sorry, 1 half parenthesis r squared minus x squared times tangent of theta. Yeah? You agree that's my cross-sectional area? Now, what do I need to do to find the volume? No, theta is fixed. Uh, the, the, the lumberjack is cutting this tree at a fixed angle, right? So theta is fixed everywhere the same. So what's volume? The integral from where to where? Negative r to r of 1 half of r squared minus x squared tangent theta dx. Agreed? Now, this is a calc 1 integral and not very hard because r squared is constant and tangent theta is constant. So when you do the integration, if you do it correctly, I think you should be getting 2 thirds r cubed tangent theta. Okay, that's the integration done. 